principle is satisfied to the part and tune of 13 in terms of differential acceleration. And for this special strong equivalence principle piece of it, um, how does gravity react to gravity? So this is really interesting. Gravity pulls on gravity. Okay, and, and general relativity would say, of course it does. Um, so that's something we can look at and test. The time rate of change of the gravitational constant is something we can also look to. We have determined that it, it changes by less than a part in 10 to the 12 per year. That's cosmologically interesting because the universe is 10 to the 10 years old. So at today's rate, it would suggest that the gravitational constant has changed by less than 1% over the age of the universe. So that's, um, it's not just scaling with expansion, for instance. Gravito magnetism is kind of a, a, a cool uh, phenomenology. Two masses, so, sounds like the start of a joke, two masses walking along a sidewalk will actually repel each other from gravito magnetic uh, interaction. So you have to use two hands to understand gravito magnetism. Left hand, point your thumb along the direction of some mass moving and it makes a circulating gravito magnetic field. Now you do a Lorentz force in that field. You do a, you know, V cross B type thing and that tells you the direction some other mass will move under that influence. So it's actually a very simple phenomenology. And when manifested in something like uh, a rotating Earth, you build up a circulating sort of mass current, you might say. Okay, that makes a gravito magnetic, it's a solenoid type field. And a gyroscope will process in that field. That's what Gravity Pro B looked for. And they measured a 19% confirmation. Sure. Things as well, geodetic precession. This is parallel transport around the curved space of the solar system of the sun. A gyroscope will point in a slightly different direction after an orbit, 19 milli arc seconds, it turns out, is the angle that you accumulate. Um, and the moon's orbit makes a kind of, picks out a direction. It's a gyroscope of sorts. Uh, there's an orientation of that orbit. Um, we can look at one over R squared force law, and it's the best test we have. It's the most sensitive test we have of one over R squared. It happens to be at 10 to the 8 meter scales, but nothing else at any other scale probes as deeply as lunar ranging. And so that's, I want to emphasize, this is the current state of, of affairs. The effort that I'll describe is, um, is poised to make a factor of 10 improvement on all of these numbers. Okay, so lunar ranging has been going on for quite some time uh, since the first reflectors were placed on the moon. And in the early days, um, it was a large telescope, the McDonald 2.7 meter telescope, and getting, you know, maybe 20 centimeter range precision, which isn't bad. Before that, it was, it was 200 meters. Um, so a, a dramatic improvement. Then in the mid 80s, it was a transition away from the large telescope to small one meter class telescopes, but with better technology and got to the centimeter level, few centimeter level. And now the effort that I'll describe has gone back to a big telescope. That was the real innovation. Why this went up? <laughs> I, if, yeah, I mean, if you'd just shown me this se section of data, I would have said, all right, it's just, yeah, consistent with random scatter. I mean, conditions can vary. That maybe they got less telescope time. Maybe they had bad, uh, well, maybe bad luck with weather. Like I think they were actually, yeah, they were tapering off the observation schedule. They were competing with astronomers for telescope time and maybe losing that battle. Um, all right, so the, the uh, experiment that I work on is called Apollo. We use the three and a half meter telescope um, in southern New Mexico. We operate 20 pulses per second. That's faster. Um, I'm just describing the advantages that we brought to the game to do a better job. We operate at a faster pulse rate. We have uh, fantastic detector technology that um, if I had to buy would be way too expensive, but we got a donation from Lincoln Laboratory. Um, we can achieve um, multiple photon per shot signal return, which Sounds pretty weak and pathetic, but compared to the competition, it, it was quite a, an advance. 
were um, intent on an integrating experiment with the analysis. That also had gotten broken over the years, and so it's not the best way to do science when you've got disconnected efforts. And of course, we have the best acronym. We're doing, we're using the APO Observatory Lunar Laser Ranging. It doesn't take long to figure out. You just need to demote the R, come up with an O, and NASA goes nuts. They can't wait to fund you. Um, and so that's been very successful. Our um, collaboration, it all really started at the University of Washington with myself, Chris Stubbs, and Eric Adelberger. And we've since, you know, spread out and accumulated um, former students and so forth at, at different places. Oh, and I should point out, we're also working with the uh, folks at Harvard, um, uh, John Chandler, Erwin Shapiro, and Bob Riesenberg, who recently made the transition uh, to UCSD on the modeling effort. So you're kind of going to yeah. Uh, Montana State. He's um, he's still in Montana. He's retired, but yeah, his Northwest analysis is is kind of his uh, vessel for still receiving uh, NASA funding to do interesting things. Yeah. Okay. So we are in, indeed using the Apollo reflectors placed on the lunar surface by by the astronauts. This is um, Neil Armstrong. Actually, it's Buzz Aldrin. Neil Armstrong has the camera. But they had just placed the lunar uh, reflector. And what are these things? They are pallets of corner cube prisms. These are solid chunks of glass with three mutually perpendicular surfaces at the back. It has the optical property that a photon coming in will rattle off all three back surfaces and come out anti-parallel to its input direction. It's like a fancy bike reflector. Um, and so. The Apollo 11 and 14 arrays have 100 of these 38 millimeter diameter, so about this big. Um, so the, the physical pieces are, are half meter scale. The Apollo 15 array is larger. It contains 300 such corner cubes. And they're organized in a nice uh, almost equilateral triangle for the Apollo arrays, the three Apollo arrays, and there are two solar, oh sorry, Soviet, uh, Soviet landed French built reflectors um, on the lunacods. And you need, by the way, at least three reflectors to lock down the lunar orientation. And only then do you understand where the center of mass of the moon is. That's what we really care, or the center of figure, I should say. Um, but we, we care about the center of mass. But having three reflectors allows you to do that. Um, having more gives you information about the distortion, the deformation of the moon, um, the moon's uh, figure, and um, sort of tidal issues. Okay, so how does this scheme work? I've got a fancy flash movie <laughs> to illustrate. So some things are right about this, some things are wrong. Not to scale. Um, <laughs> It's been slowed down dramatically. We're shooting 20 pulses per second, but we do have about 50 in route at any given time. So that, that part is represented. We have instantly, after we fire the laser, uh, the atmosphere, the turbulence in the atmosphere makes the signal uh, diverge, the beam diverge, even if it's collimated as well as we can do. So one arc second is typical. That's the astronomical seeing. At the moon, one arc second is two kilometers. So most of the light just misses. And even if we're directly aimed at the, at the target to sub-arc second precision, uh, most of the light is spread out. The, the few 1 in 30 million of the photons that actually will hit the reflector may start making their way back and spread due to diffraction of the corner cube. And so that, in fact, is a larger angle than 1 arc second. And by the time it hits the Earth, it's maybe 10 or 15 kilometers across. And some very small fraction of that, another part in 10 to 8 or so, uh, will hit the, the telescope. So, um, yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. The, they are, the rear surfaces of each are, are well aligned to the 90 degree standard, so you get a 
you know, largely diffraction limited from each one, but the individual ones are not. And in fact, the moon goes through a libration of seven plus or minus seven degrees tip tilt, so it's hopeless. You can't lock them down. Right. And, and the truth is that we have a very complicated diffraction pattern from the combination of this that's yeah. changing all the time as the orientation but changes. Oh, yeah. Tremendous fluctuations. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the, the basic uh, scheme. These guys make it look really easy. Um, <laughs> In the course of an afternoon, they set up something on the roof for the Big Bang Theory and, uh, and showed that it works. And they got two and a half seconds. They were happy, and they packed it up. Um, so all in a day's work. Um, for me, it took years. But that's just because I'm not as good. Um, <laughs> here's the site at Apache Point. Here's the Sloan 2.5 meter, the 3.5 meter telescope. Um, there's the laser mounted on the telescope and some people for scale. So um, a lot of people here are familiar with the observatory because Princeton is one of the partner institutions. Um, it's a good site. It's high elevation. It's got, well, you know, you could knock me for saying it's got great seeing. But, um, you know, it's at the one arc second scale. Um, one and a half is fairly typical, actually. But the, the idea, it's a nice, oops, it's a nice flexibly scheduled telescope. And we tend to get something like eight one-hour segments throughout the lunar month. The idea is we just want to make a few spot measurements around the lunar orbit. We're really trying to measure the shape of the moon's orbit. That's where the interesting uh, physics comes in. So the laser itself, this is a two-foot by four-foot optical bench showing the, the laser innards. Um, it's a neodymium YAG laser with uh, two laser rods, one for the oscillator, the other for an amplifier. It's uh, frequency doubled by this crystal to 532. So the font color is close, but this laser does a better job of telling what 532 looks like. Um, and it's short pulses. So 100 picoseconds is about this far in light distance. Um, and so we're really sending out these pancakes of, of light. They're very thin, and they fill the, the aperture of the telescope. We have about 100 millijoules per pulse at 20 hertz. That gives you 20, about 2 watts of average power, but about gigawatt peak power. Um, it does actually burn your skin. If you pass your hand in front of the laser beam where it comes out, out the side of the, of the laser um, box, and you pass your hand across it, you hear a pop, 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 you know, at 20 hertz, and you'll have three nice round blisters, and you <laughs> and you'd never do it again. You know what <laughs> happens, and you don't need to do it again. Um, so we expand to about three and a half meter to, to, the, to the near full aperture of the telescope. And um, um, so physically, this is two feet and four feet. Um, and this is on an optical bench that sits on the back of the telescope. I think I'll have some pictures of what that looks like in a minute. Um, this is our de detector. Yes, and I will actually comment on planes um, in a little bit. So, um, and it's kind of like a moth to a flame. You know, they see the laser. They no, they don't really. But um, so, this is our detector. It's a four by four array of avalanche photodiodes. 30 micron, actually we're using a 40 micron uh, active area now on 100 micron centers. And avalanche photodiodes are really great because you can get very good timing performance out of them from a single photon detection. But the problem is if you have multiple photons coming back in a pulse, you only respond to the first photon. And you don't want to bias your time measurement to the early photons. So we essentially have multiple buckets sitting out, 16 buckets. And we oversample the point spread function. Um, so this is about 1.4 arc seconds across. And so the point spread function pretty much fills this, uh, this detector. And statistically, we spread out the photons so that um, if we're getting an average of, say, one photon per pulse, which is actually a good night, um, 
we're not crowding them into the same detector. So that's important. Um, we also have a lens lit array in front because there's a lot of dead space on this detector, but we have a lens lit array to recover that fill factor. And um, we end up with this, so the image, really this is the focal plane of the telescope is on this lens lit array, and these are pupil planes. But in any case, um, this gives us some sense of where we're pointing. If we are mispointed a little bit, we'll see the returns kind of favoring this corner. We know which way to move the telescope. If you have a single element and you start to lose the signal, you have to guess which of four directions might be best to go. So it's, it's very good for, uh, for tracking and optimizing our, uh, our signal. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay. So, this is, imagine a lens sitting in front of this. That's a 1.4 arc second field of view. And so, let's say a photon hits here. There's a square around this uh, element, and any photon that falls in that square gets diverted by the lens toward, toward the element back here. That's right. Okay, so this is the laser box on the telescope. We call it the Utah box. I'll leave it to your imagination why we might call it that. This is what we call the phone booth, although some in the collaboration call it a TARDIS. I barely know what that is. But um, uh, we have also a corner cube that sits up on the secondary mirror, and that's a very important thing. That gives us a reference measurement. So some of the light right before it goes out of the telescope um, toward the moon some of the light is intercepted, sent back toward the instrument, and detected by exactly the same detector and electronics as will detect the lunar photons, and it gives us a reference uh, signal. So really, we're doing a differential measurement between this corner cube and the corner cube on the moon. And any variations in our electronics or detector subtracted away. This thing is rigid enough it won't vibrate. And one nice thing is by attaching to the glass, glass is a low expansion coefficient. And so as temperature varies, if you're focused, if your telescope is focused and you do that at the beginning of each observation, the distance between the, the two pieces of glass does, doesn't actually change very much. I mean, it will a little bit as temperature goes. We have a, yeah, we have a lot of attenuation on this. That's right. Um, it's on the na in the neighborhood of about 40 nanoseconds. Um, the total time from the time the laser pulses and gets up to the uh, corner cube and gets back down is something like, I think, 90 nanoseconds. Not at all. Just just the stuff inside the box, but <coughs> certainly the telescope is just ambient. Absolutely. Yeah, it's smaller than we, we <coughs> need to compensate. I mean, we care about 10 and 20 degree differentials might show up at the millimeter level between the, the, the glass, but you're not going to get gradients bigger than that. That's correct. Okay, um, you can see the same scene in the background here, the Mythbusters people who visited the site. Actually, something very interesting happened. They wanted us to point to an area that was not a reflector to show that we get no signal. That's easy. We can get no signal. <laughs> right. And then they wanted us to point to the reflector and show the signal come up. And, and so we, we did that. We pointed to the reflector. The signal came up. And then suddenly, mysteriously, it disappeared. Like, just went away, and we were scratching our heads what we had it, what was going, what's going wrong. And, and then we noticed that the telescope had jumped a few arc seconds, and this 
doesn't typically happen. There were a lot of people up in the dome for this filming, a lot of the crew. And when they said, hey, we have the signal, some people ran past and like a shoulder hit the, the telescope or something and it, it jogged us. We don't no, normally see this. And I thought, what if they're being super clever? What if they said, okay, as soon as they report seeing a signal, I want you to do this to the telescope. If they get confused and it goes away, it's no conspiracy, right? They're not making it up. It turns out it was just. <laughs> Did we land on the moon? <laughs> All right. I'm not, enough said. I've wasted enough time on it already. Um, so some nice pictures of, uh, of the laser beam coming out through the side and then illuminating the primary mirror going up toward the moon. And then we get some of these. Dan Long, some of you may know at Apache Point, um, is an excellent photographer. He took this really nice eclipse shot. And um, what we get back is is um, as minutes roll by, this is about four minutes, and this is the offset from our prediction in nanoseconds. So it goes from minus 20 to 15 nanoseconds. Um, one nanosecond light travel is about a foot per nanosecond. So uh, round trip, you move the moon by six inches and you've got a one nanosecond um, uh, sort of uh, delay. So the thickness of this return, these are the lunar photons, the thickness is about one nanosecond. That means about a six inch uh, uh, sort of uh, spread. And that is due to the finite physical size of the array tilted as the moon goes through libration. It's not always face on. In fact, it almost never is. And so that spreads the array. And you see the pink trapezoid here is the theoretical shape for that night that the return should take on. This, by contrast, is from our local fiducial, the local corner cube. And so you can see a tremendous spread, whereas the smaller Apollo arrays on the same night have a smaller uh, spread. So we're seeing the size of the arrays. These are you know, thousands of photons collected in you know, 5,000 shots. And it's fun sometimes to write down the measurement that we were making uh, to all, all the digits and then some error bar. And yeah, and the total number of photons looks like this, yeah. So should they have put up smaller reflectors? They should have put up reflectors that were sparse so that we could resolve individual corner cubes. Right now, if I improve my laser pulse width by a factor of two, no difference. It's not enough to resolve the individual corner cubes, and I'm still dominated by this term in the error budget. But as soon as you make it sparse, I've got every incentive to improve my ground system. So believe me, any future next generation uh, reflectors will be sparse. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's not the mystery. It's just that in order to centroid this, you now have an uncertainty to battle, and you don't know when a particular photon early or late. So you get a spread, and that spread is unavoidable. Yes. That's really the center, that's the telescope axis intersection. That's what we sort of reference to, because that's the sort of fixed point. Um, so we. Yeah, you can do better than root in, front, but yeah, by a little bit. That's right. Uh, this just shows you the um, sort of functional form of the fiducial lo local corner cube return and a functional fit to that. There's an asymmetric tail due to some detector device physics. Um, and then the, um, the red is the trapezoid <coughs> shape from this tilted array. And the, this blue curve is simply a convolution of these two. And, and so that's how we actually 
do the measurement is we, we measure this, we fit it, we know this piece, we convolve, and then all we do is slide it to figure out where it needs to be to best fit. So yeah, you actually do end up beating the statistics a little bit by the edges. Um, and so that's kind of how it works in practice. The tail is understood. It's pho so photons come in, make a photoelectron. If that happens in the electric field region of this device, it's a prompt, you know, driven uh, electron that avalanches promptly. But if it goes a little bit deeper and hits the region without an electric field beyond the depletion region, it will random walk around for some time, and and it can take nanoseconds before it stumbles into the avalanche region and yeah so those are delayed so this just this just shows you a different uh libration um sort of uh uh nights different nights different orientations we get different trapezoids and we see the, the um, signal following the return shape following and in fact we've done the exercise of of figuring out what is the actual tilt of the array given our observations and I can say that the astronauts pointed within one degree of the e expectation. So they were professionals. They, they did it right. Um, we've exceeded by a factor of 70 or so the previous records for just photon rate. And that's really kind of what we're about. We're trying to reduce the just statistical uncertainty of this measurement by getting lots of photons. That's why the big telescope and the, the detector array and so forth. Um, but we can also operate at full moon, which is off limits for other stations, and that's where the equivalence principle signal is maximum. I didn't really hit that point, but if you're looking for differential acceleration of Earth and moon toward the sun, from the Earth's point of view, it's as if the moon's orbit is polarized or shifted towards or away from the sun. So that signal is maximum at full moon, new moon. New moon is off limits entirely, but full moon is important. Um, and the APD array is letting us get these high photon uh, returns. Yeah, yeah, they would kick me off the telescope if I pointed the telescope near the sun. Um, it would probably weld, art, you know, it, it, would, it would slice off the upper top end of the telescope from the image. Okay, so, um, we recently installed this summer an absolute calibration system that is moving us from precision. I've been using all these years precision, and I'm now starting to shift over to millimeter accuracy because what we're doing is we've got a fast uh, pulse laser with very short pulses, and, and uh, one millimeter, by the way, is 6.7 picoseconds in round trip time. So. 10 picosecond pulse uh, fiber laser locked to a cesium clock. So the pulses really are at 80 megahertz to very high accuracy. And um, that locking is better than one picosecond. So these pulses really are on time. And we can uh, send an 80 megahertz train into a modulator, tell it which ones we want, and send those pulses to our detector, our avalanche photodiode. And in fact, we can superimpose those and overlay them on top of the lunar photon. So while we're measuring the moon, we can put these tick marks in from these, this well-regulated reference laser. And you know, the original idea was actually more mundane, which is let's build a system to deliver photons on time, and we'll ask what we get out of the measurement, what our system tells us that delta t is, but we know the truth then we'll find systematic errors and fix them. And then we're, we're, we, we started building that system and said, you know, we could actually just overlay the darn things. And even if we never find the sources of systematics, we can just directly calibrate them out. So it's been very, uh, very nice. This is, uh, this is what we get. It's, I, I'm tempted to call this our stars and stripes diagram. but. This is the shot number. This is 10,000 shots, which takes about eight minutes for us to, to accumulate. And the vertical axis is our fine increment delta T. The total window is about 17 nanoseconds long. Um, actually, sorry, it's about uh, 
38 nanosecond song. But um, this, is, this is our fine resolution time. The red dots are the lunar photons. Those are actual lunar returns. Uh, we can't control where they come better than our clock, which for our system is a 50 megahertz clock that gives us 20 nanosecond resolution of where we, we can deliberately place these lunar photons within 20 nanoseconds. And you'll notice that they the red ones occupy some band that's about 20 nanoseconds long. Sorry? Um, because we know for a given shot exactly when a real lunar photon would return. We have a good prediction. So um, we, we know for a given shot when the laser fired. And so we can, we can predict, OK, if the laser fired at that exact moment, it's going to go around two and a half seconds, but we know exactly how much to the nanosecond. And so we expect that for that shot, a lunar photon will come in exact, ex exactly this time. And these red dots for that particular shot land right where we would have expected. They are, let me skip uh, one slide ahead and show you that this is what happens when you register those events on the prediction. And you see a very tall spike this red spike for the lunar, but you do have some noise, some background. Right. So the, the blue ones are just all these others. The yellow ones are from our new calibra calibration laser. So those are the sort of tick marks that we're laying across. All right. And, and you can see they're sloping and then reversing. That's from the clock drift of a 50 megahertz clock that runs our, our system relative to the cesium clock. So that's a GPS discipline clock, and that's a clock that at this point it said, oh, I need to change the frequency a little bit. And you see the clock drift change direction, and it's trying to steer onto uh, the right frequency. But now it stands out like a sore thumb in our calibrator, which is fantastic. Um, so. Yeah, I won't stress the other subtle point here. But all of the, the, these black, the difference between the black and the blue here, these are actually identified calibration photons. Because likewise, we know when they're going to come, too. And so we can identify them, basically, by falling you know, in that stripe. Um, so we can separate them nicely. And then we can do statistics on those calibration photons. And the st statistics are looking very clean, very Gaussian. And what we're seeing is that we have offsets in the one or two millimeter range. Um, in some sense, for me, that's the sweet spot. If we'd come up with 15, 20 millimeters, I would have been embarrassed. I would have said, wow, we didn't really, we weren't doing as well as we thought we were. Um, if it had been zero, I would have taken a victory lap, but then thought, well, all that effort, you know, this great new tool, we, we don't really even need it. Um, so it gives us some interesting things to chase down. We see channel-dependent timing offsets that we already knew about and we were correcting, but it took us months to accumulate data. We had to have good lunar signal, uh, strong lunar signals to even calibrate that, those things out. Now we get it in 10 minutes. So we're very excited about this new phase. Okay, so let's jump back something about the measurement and the instrument. Um, to the science and what, we're, what uh, we can get out of it and what the other techniques are. And um, there are other ways to test general relativity. And a lot of these things that I put up that lunar ranging can do, there are other competitive techniques. The closest tends to be pulsars. And they're typically, they're close, but they're about a factor of 10 away. Now, pulsar observations will continue to accumulate and grow, and they might find some really amazing uh, systems that are really well suited uh, for testing GR. And so that's going to improve, but so we're also trying to improve lunar ranging. So I think for the near term, lunar ranging will stay in front. One question is, is, uh, is an improvement by a factor of 10 enough to you know, rattle the theorists? And the answer is, in, in many cases, not really. It's an open parameter space. 
it's an interesting parameter space. I mean, there could be violations in this zone, but you know, if we go another factor of 10 and have a null result, uh, not many people pack up and leave. Um, there are some alternatives like the DGP gravity um, that have some, um, some predictions that would be falsifiable, but you know, little corners like that. So, well, what about, you know, going deeper? What if we went better than a millimeter? Is that possible? I think certainly sparse reflectors on the moon would be, uh, would be a, a big boon, but active transponders would be even better. And at that point, you could even extend beyond the moon and do larger lever arm tests across the solar system. Um, but the model... Um, so this is a, a, a record for you know, several days showing the, the signal, the ocean loading effect at a 10 times bigger scale. So the scale is amplified for these small things, and then the red is the residual. But you know, the, the basic idea is by using this gravimeter, we get a nice proxy for actually how is the site moving vertically. We also have GPS in the, in the vicinity, and we do see drifts on top of the plate motion. So this is the anomalous drift, and the scale is millimeters, and the vertical is kind of more interesting. But still, we have these measurements. We can tell something about how the site is moving. Now, you might be despairing at all the things that we have to, um, oops, all the things we have to take care of to, to understand our, our measurement. One thing I'll point out, though, it's very important. The science signals we're after are narrow band. They're periodic. We know the frequencies. All, almost all this other stuff is broadband. Um, anything having to do with the, uh, um, you know, groundwater or atmospherics, um, and so we'd like to characterize them and get rid of them as best we can. But they don't mimic the physics we're trying to study. So it's not as hopeless as all that. It's just kind of, you know, makes it more interesting. Um, I won't dwell on this, but we did find this reflector that had been missing for many years. Um, nobody knew exactly where it was, and so it's here. Um, <laughs> this is uh, an image from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So um, we spent years looking for it, and I'll let you spend a few minutes looking for it, <laughs> or seconds. Um, so, does anybody spot? <laughs> it's right there. See how the, the shadows, the sun, the sun angle is coming this way. You can tell from the craters. And this thing has a shadow off this direction. That's how we pinned it down. We knew within five kilometers where it was, but, well, no, we couldn't see the retroreflector. Uh, when we searched for it sometimes, but it was too, uh, too hard for us to find it. And as soon as the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter came along, we actually were able to, to shoot at it. We have something like a 500 nanosecond window. When we first tried, we saw some spike at the edge of the window, which is always suspicious. Uh, but then we changed our timing real time during the run, and that signal stayed. And so it was real. And in fact, it really surprised us how strong the signal was. The first ever measurement um, gave us 2,000 photons in this first try. And, and um, you know, obviously there was a press release about this, and I responded to uh, reporters by saying it, it was quiet for 40 years. It had a lot to say, but then somebody at Apache Point really nailed it. Your discovery gives hope to all of us who lost something during the 70s. <laughs> so worked out really well. So it's a, it's a good reflector to have found because it's the farthest away in longitude and the farthest in latitude, so it gives you better to the orientations. Um, and these numbers just give you some sense of the latitude and longitude sensitivity, and this new one uh, is sort of excellent on, on all fronts. So that's a really nice find. The last little story I want to tell you is about the reflector degradation. 
So we expect, of course, 100% from the reflectors. But what we got was 10%. And during full moon, it dipped another factor of 10. And we called it the full moon curse, kind of amused for a while. And then it became less funny as it, as it persisted. And this is just showing real data across lunar phase. Uh, full moon is in the middle. And this is, you know, our signal rate is highly variable. We're sensitive to the fourth power of atmospheric seeing. And so we can get really low and we can get, you know, around one photon per shot or a few photons per shot. But there is this deficit around full moon we could never do very well, even in excellent conditions. So in the background isn't to blame. It does come up, but it's not that it's not just that we don't have the, the sensitivity. And if you actually look at the background, you see from our same detector, you see that the background rises near full moon and it's up like um, and then it comes back down. If we had a similar deficit in the background, if our detector were being impaired by the bright light, for instance, we'd see a dip here in the middle on, on our background measurement. We don't. And meanwhile, if you do the same plot, the same style plot I showed in the previous slide, in the early 70s and then the late 70s and the early 80s, you see this little dip starting to appear from the old McDonald telescope data. So it is a real thing that crept in. and the, um, the story is that you've got your corner cube. Ordinarily, light goes through and hits the, the back surfaces and comes out. Maybe a tiny bit of attenuation at the front surface, um, you know, 4% loss or so at each passing. But if you put dust on the, on the thing, suddenly you have less light getting through. It goes a double pass through this dust. That's the 10% at all phases explanation. Now, if you take sunlight at full moon, this reflector is facing the sun. Put sunlight on the dust, it heats up. And it doesn't get red hot, but that's just PowerPoint. And what that means is you end up making a hot front and a cooler back. So this path goes deeper into the corner cube and experiences a cooler path. Whereas one out near the edge sees a warmer uh, trajectory, and so it actually goes slower because the refractive index is a function of temperature. And so that results in a spherical wavefront coming out. It's retarded on the edges, advanced in the middle. So now that spreads the light, and we get less. Now, I did extensive modeling, also laboratory verification of the corner cube um, diffraction pattern. So these are two different polarizations in the total. This is the model. This is the data from the lab bench. And so we understand very well what happens, you know, diffractively in these devices. And so now we can model what happens when we add a thermal gradient. And we can see what happens to the, to the diffraction pattern. And what we see is that by the time you get even just 4 degrees Kelvin difference between the front surface and the tip, you've lost it. You, you really destroy the signal. So that's um, what I believe is going on. An eclipse gives you a brilliant opportunity to test this. You can turn off the sun and see what happens. And so um, what we see, might be hard to see, but we, we have the line coming down. This is the illumination um, coming down to zero and then coming back here. And the return rate soaring during the eclipse and then returning to poor performance when the light returns. And again, it's not signal to noise. It's just the signal. But, but the temperature gradient doesn't go away. It's well, it does because it's not yeah, it is fast enough. But if you calculate the thermal time constant of a piece of glass this size, it, it works out. And simulations kind of show that that's Sunlight, yeah. It's a star. <laughs> it isn't. It, the obscuration is, you're not deeply troubled by the fact that the dust is there and obscuring the signal. It's more important. That lowers it at all phases, and then we get this additional dip when, from ther a thermal effect when the sun heats the dust. I can't really tell. What I can tell from my measurements is it's roughly a 50% covering factor right now. Um, and that's enough to do <coughs> this. And, 
It looks like it increases, and the mechanisms for moving dust around on the moon are largely electrostatic from X-ray and, and um, you know, photoionization of the dust grains, um, and also solar wind deposition of, of charge, especially in the, on the back side. But you charge up the dust grains, that's not enough to get dust grains to actually separate because the surface contact forces are, are large enough. But if, if now you can excite mechanically uh, those dust grains by micrometeorites, and, and that's a cascade process, by the way, because it just sort of um, rattle, rattles out. Now you can have levitation, and, and these dust grains can transport. Okay. So, um, nice visuals. I want you to spend a second. Can people name for me things they see in this picture? Just free association. Words associated with things you see. Sun? Well, somebody said the thing that I was hoping they would say is sun. That's actually the moon. All right. So, um, that's an actual photograph by Dan Long. Now, let me show you something that is really, I think, really fun to watch. This is a time lapse that Dan Long put together. You can see our laser coming on and off. Uh, somebody, that's Mars. And you see some stars here. And you see occasionally a spotter, aircraft spotter on the thing. You see some guy down here with the camera. Um, and what you see is the moon is starting to get dark. So this is the, the, one of these eclipse nights. And you can also maybe tell that we're shooting sometimes high, sometimes low. We're, we're hitting different reflectors. Um, and so we're just kind of cycling around and, and making measurements. And now you see the lights of El Paso. Um, the Milky Way will start coming up over here. Um, kind of amusing to see this happening over on the side too. Um, <laughs> real, imaginary, or fake. Um, some people with flashlights, a Sloan telescope moving around. Um, here's Scorpius coming in. And um, now the moon starts coming out and getting bright. So that's a, uh, you know, I, I worked on this project for many years without visual gratification. Uh, when I'm there at the site, I'm not outside. I'm working at the computer. So I've barely ever seen this thing actually shooting at the moon. Um, and so these uh, photos and videos that Dan Long put together are really uh, exquisite. Okay, so um, just wrapping up, last uh, little point. Oh dear. Um, is that um, air, aircraft um, uh, avoidance is important. We don't want to shoot an airplane and blind a pilot. It wouldn't hurt the airplane, but it could bl blind a uh, passenger or pilot. And then all these laser guide star adaptive optics systems also shooting lasers might be shut down. Nobody in the community wants this to happen. And so I actually ended up developing a transponder detector um, for our purposes. And it works so well that these other observatories are now using it. So the CAC and Gemini and uh, Large Binocular Telescope, Subaru, all have these now. And um, uh, so we've replaced spotters. We no longer have to have people outside watching the sky, which is uh, my anti-jobs program, and it's worked very well. Um, yeah, it's, so anything above 10,000 feet has to have a transponder operating. You, you could get away with it within 2,000 feet of the ground. Um, in practice, the FAA is willing to say functionally what's the expected traffic in your area. And so, so far, they, the FAA has signed off on these observatory locations. It would be harder to do for a sea level operation. Okay. So, just quick summary. A lunar laser ranging station. Uh, we've got this new calibration system that's a game changer. We're looking at order of magnitude gains, certainly in the measurement. We've got that already. We're looking to get, get the model um, there, and then we'll have tests of fundamental gravity that are much better. Uh, we've got 10 years now of, of good data um, that, that we can work with, and baselines are important. There are a lot of long periods at play in the lunar orbit. Um, 
And so, and then we've had some nice, fun surprises along the way. I hope there are more. That's it. Uh, no, no, we've got them all now. I, it's a very persuasive argument. It's it's a, almost a no-brainer. They're cheap, they're passive, they last for decades. So it's, expensive. it's expensive to get there. So if there's a ride, it's almost certain that we'd have a new reflector. Um, but it's not a big enough driver to justify a ride. Be cheaper, it's automated. <laughs> it could be automated. In fact, my idea is a is like imagine a at a golf driving range, you have a bucket of golf balls. You just toss out a bucket of these corner cubes. Some will point the right way and some won't, but they'll be sparse and you'll so figure out where they are. The yeah, you wait them. Yep, sure. They are not terribly interested in, in any help or any input. So uh, there have been efforts, but they've got their own plans. Uh, I don't know if they have any lunar ambitions at the moment, but Maybe yeah. A anybody who goes, I mean, we've got our ears open for any any rides. So, uh, yeah. In my case study for Apogee, they have pumped a lot of the program, and they understand what the the jet, but they basically know that you know anytime they sense something, they'll want to do it. Yep, so that's right. So, yeah, the overall egress is about 3.8 centimeters per year. Um, no, it's something that when you, when you do the actual model, you put in some parameter that characterizes the physical dissipation. And, and the model basically then produces a linear uh, um, term, and you sort of, that's a fit parameter in the model. So we're not actually, and, and I don't know, it, it's a complicated enough model, and there are, there are ways that parameters can hide and, and, and correlations that get in the way. So I don't think we'd ever produce a plot of showing the actual egress rate and be able to look at variations. I, I think we have to just except a, a large-scale fit. Um, so green, it's kind of a almost economic decision in a lot of ways. It's easy. Uh, it's, it's right in the middle of the visible band, so you have good natural aversion to it, and that actually reduces the eye safety limits on, on the thing. Um, it's, it's right near the peak of the um, silicon detector um, sensitivity. Uh, so certainly, you know, infrared, my big decision was should I do infrared or green? I didn't really do much, you know, consideration of, of, uh, of higher... Um, uh, higher frequency, but I mean certainly green was a good match to uh, to to our system and to the other requirements of detection and so forth. It would work at at uh, shorter wavelengths too. That's true. Yes, the seeing is worse. Yeah, I mean that's 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 a certainly an effect in the link, 
Now the other penalty though is since we're doing single photon measurements, you have fewer photons for the same power. 